Hey, little buddies, it's Uncle Rick from the Uncle Rick Audio Book Club. And today I am reading to you in this podcast a bit from one of my very, very, very favorite books that I have ever recorded, The True Story of Benjamin Franklin by Elbridge Brooks. If you ever get a chance to read a book by Elbridge Brooks, it's most likely going to be a good one. This is about Ben Franklin, as I say. And we're reading chapter 3, How the Printer Learned the Truth of an Old Proverb. The first thing Ben Franklin did when he stepped ashore on the Market Street Wharf in Philadelphia was to hunt around for something to eat, for he was desperately hungry. Up the street, he saw a baker's boy with a big basket of bread. At once, he hailed him and asked him for ten cents worth of bread. The boy handed it out to him, three big puffy rolls, something entirely new to the Boston boy who was looking for what he called biscuits. Ben's pockets were so stuffed out with other things that he did not know just what to do with three loaves. He did know, however, that he felt hungry enough to eat all three. So he stuck one under each arm and taking big bites out of the third roll as he walked along, went sightseeing through the Philadelphia streets. I suppose this hungry, munching boy was rather a comical sight for a Sunday morning in staid and sober Philadelphia. He himself tells us that he made, quote, a most awkward, ridiculous appearance, unquote. Other people thought so, too. As he passed one of the houses on Market Street, a young girl of about his own age, who was standing in the doorway, looked curiously at this rather tattered, though good-looking young stranger, and wondered where under the sun he could have come from, and what he was doing eating his breakfast thus in the open street. It was no wonder that she should look and laugh at this dilapidated young runaway. His coat pockets were bulging out with his extra baggage of shirts and stockings. His buckskin breeches were creased and soiled. His out-of-shape hat looked as if it had been slept in, and altogether he was rather a frowsy, seedy-appearing young man, while the two big rolls stuck under his arms added to his comical looks. Ben, indeed, felt himself, as I have told you, that he cut a pretty poor figure, for he was always a neat and presentable young fellow who prided himself on always looking trim and smart. But any boy would be rather seedy-looking after eleven days of knocking about with no chance for a change of clothing. I know how it is myself. I tramped across country once with two other boys when I was about 15 on a vacation walk from New York to Boston, almost without baggage, and I know what a shabby-looking trio we were when we got to Boston. But that girl in the doorway, whose name was Deborah Reed, never forgot that travel-stained young stranger who passed her father's door eating his breakfast that famous Sunday morning. For years after, Deborah Reed became Mrs. Benjamin Franklin. The boy wandered about the town, taking in everything as he walked, in his usual wide-awake way, and at last found himself again at the place where he had landed, on Market Street Wharf. He still had his extra bread under his arm, for although he was hungry, one of these big loaves was really a meal. So he took a drink of river water, gave his remaining loaves to a poor woman who had a little boy with her, and who looked quite as friendless and just as hungry as himself. Feeling a little better after his breakfast, but still very sleepy, he walked up Market Street again and followed the crowd into a big meeting house, that's a church, on the corner of Second and Market Streets. There he sat down in a pew and at once fell sound asleep. He slept all through the service and then going out got into conversation with a friendly young Quaker who told him where he could find a cheap and comfortable lodging at a tavern near Chestnut Street called the Crooked Billet. He went to the little tavern and slept all day and all night, waking up just long enough to get his dinner and supper. The next morning, being Monday, he felt rested at last, and after breakfast went out to hunt for work. At the first printing office he went to, whom should he meet but the good Mr. Bradford he had seen in New York. He had come on to Philadelphia unexpectedly, and when he saw the young printer, he went with him to the shop of a printer named Keimer and recommended the boy as an excellent workman. And so, on his very first day in Philadelphia, Franklin found a good job. Mr. Keimer, his new employer, was a curious old fellow, but took kindly to his new journeyman and hunted up a boarding place for him, which, as luck would have it, 
happened to be the house of the very Mr. Reed, whose daughter had seen and smiled at the tramping young printer as he walked up Market Street eating his open-air breakfast on his first morning in Philadelphia. His troubles for a time were over, as he had steady work and good wages with Mr. Keimer. He had a pleasant boarding place. He made friends speedily, as such a bright, cheery young fellow is apt to do. He kept on reading and studying just as he had in Boston. But he could not keep from thinking very often of the home he had left in Boston and wondering how they all were there. Although he did not let his people know where he was because he was afraid that if they did, he might be arrested and sent back to Boston as a runaway apprentice. At length, however, he did hear from home. His brother-in-law was captain of a sloop that ran between Boston and Newcastle on the Delaware, some 40 miles below Philadelphia. Somehow or other, Captain Holmes, for that was his brother-in-law's name, learned that Ben was in Philadelphia. He wrote to the boy at once, telling him how badly his father and mother felt because Ben had run away, and how they had worried about him. He told him, too, that if he would go back to Boston and his brother's employ, all would be forgiven. But although he would gladly have seen his folks once more, Ben had no idea of going back. So he wrote a reply to Captain Holmes explaining just why he had run away and all about his brother's harsh treatment. He said, too, that he was much better off where he was, and as he had now got a footing in the world, he meant to stay in his new home. Philadelphia was the place for a young man to get ahead, he said. When Captain Holmes read Ben's letter, he understood things better and believed the boy was right. He decided that Ben had been harshly treated by Brother James, and that after all he was not such a bad boy as people in Boston imagined. Now it happened that when Captain Holmes received young Ben Franklin's letter, he was in the company of no less a person than Sir William Keith, the governor of Pennsylvania. In those days when the American colonies were subject to the British crown, the King of England used to appoint men to have charge of the several colonies, each one being called a governor, although very few of them amounted to much in the way of being able to govern. So Sir William Keith was governor of Pennsylvania. He had been appointed with the king's consent by the sons of William Penn, who owned the charter of this province. Proprietaries, they were called. Of course, that made Governor Keith quite a great man in the eyes of the people, even if he was not a good man. And young Ben's letter was such an excellent one, and so well written, that Captain Holmes showed it to the governor, asking him if he did not think his brother-in-law a likely young fellow. Ben could write very well, you know, and the governor was so taken by the way in which the letter was written, and by what Captain Holmes said of the young man, that he said he would like to see young Franklin and have a talk with him. Perhaps, he said, I can do something for him. There isn't a decent printer in Philadelphia. I'd like to set up a bright and promising young fellow like him in business. So one day as Ben was setting type in Keimer's printing office, who should call upon him and set the whole office to staring but the governor of Pennsylvania himself? Queer Mr. Keimer supposed, of course, that the governor wished to see him. But no, Sir William said he wished to see young Mr. Franklin. Then the governor, in his velvets and ruffles, took young Mr. Franklin off to the tavern with him, and there, after telling Ben of the good report he had heard from Captain Holmes, the governor said that such a bright young fellow ought to be able to do well if he could only get a good footing, and he finally proposed to Ben that if his father would help him start in business in Philadelphia, he, Sir William Keith, would see that he had all the government printing and much more besides. He made such promises and so flattered the young man that Ben felt sure his fortune was as good as made. The governor invited him to call, had him often to dine, and got him so filled with the idea of starting for himself in Philadelphia that finally Franklin did go back to Boston to see his father and try to get his help. It was in the month of April, 1724, that Ben Franklin sailed home to Boston. His return was quite different from his going. Then he had sneaked away by stealth, a runaway apprentice. Now he went sailing back, with money in his pocket, his passage paid, good clothes on his back, and a letter of praise and promises to his father from a real live governor. It reads almost like a fairy tale, doesn't it? The young man felt that it was almost like a fairy story, too. He felt like a prince coming back, and quite like a prince did he conduct himself. 
Everyone welcomed him back, except Brother James. And when young Ben strolled into the printing office with quite a lordly air, telling big stories of Philadelphia, showing off his fine new watch, displaying his money, patronizing the apprentice boys, and treating the journeyman, his brother scowled at him and was sulky and silent. When Mrs. Franklin tried to bring the brothers together and have them make it up, James flatly refused. He complained to his mother that Ben had been impudent, that he had shown off in the printing office, and insulted him, James Franklin, before all his people. Josiah Franklin, Ben's wise father, read the governor's letter. Then he talked it all over with Captain Holmes, who was also back in Boston. But Josiah Franklin evidently did not take to Ben's plan. The governor, he said, must be a person of very little judgment to talk of setting up a boy of eighteen in business. Why, it was absurd, he said. So, while he was glad that Ben was doing so well and had made such good and influential friends, he told him he was flatly opposed to his thinking of starting in business before he was twenty-one. You just work and save until that time, Ben, he said, and then if I can help you a little I will do so. But this scheme of the governor's is wild, and I do not like it. So, Ben had to go back without the money he needed. To tell the truth, he hardly expected his father would do what he desired, though he did think that with a governor to back him, his father might have felt inclined to help. But he had great faith in Sir William Keith and thought that the governor would be able to fix things somehow. And sure enough, when he had returned to Philadelphia, after bidding goodbye to all his Boston friends and bringing away the good wishes and kind words of everyone except sulky brother James, the governor said he would see him through. Your father is too prudent, he said, after he had read the thankful but decisive letter of refusal which Josiah Franklin had sent him by Ben. It's good all men are not so cautious. There never would be anything done. Such a likely young fellow as you, Franklin, he continued, ought to be helped to a good start in life. And if your father won't do it, why, I will. You just figure up and find how much money you need to start a good printing office here, and then come to me. So, highly elated over his great good fortune, Ben figured up how much was needed and told the governor that with about $500 he could start a fine office. $500, eh? said Governor Keith. That's not so much. Suppose now you should go across to London to stock up. Couldn't you get a better outfit there for the money than you could here? Ben told him he certainly could. Then, too, continued the governor, you could make acquaintance there and form connections with booksellers to do business for them here. Yes, that's a good plan. I think you'd better go. So get yourself ready, Franklin, to go over with Captain Ennis. I'll give you letters of introduction and credit that will help you through, and we'll show your father at Philadelphia, too, what a fine business we can do. Here was a great chance, thought Ben. He could not thank the governor enough. What a lucky fellow I am, he said to himself, to have so great a man as Governor Sir William Keith as a friend. And at once he made ready to sail for London, feeling himself a rich man already. So when a few months later the ship London Hope, Captain Annis, master, set sail from Philadelphia for London, Ben Franklin went on board, well fitted out and full of great expectations. To be sure, the governor had not given him the letters he promised, but the governor's secretary saw him off and said the letters would come on board with the mail packet. Ben felt very happy. He was going to England. He would see London, the splendid city he had so longed to visit, full of books and great people. He was going with a governor's backing and introduction. He was engaged to Deborah Reed, whom he was to marry, when he got back, and everything was delightful. I don't wonder the young man felt happy, do you? He was well received on board the vessel as a friend of the governor. He made many pleasant acquaintances and some good and enduring friendships. And so he sailed over the sea, proud and confident and cheerful. But alas, pride as you know often goes before a fall, and poor Ben Franklin's fall was sudden and heavy. For when he got to London he had a terrible disappointment. There were no letters of recommendation, introduction, or credit for him to deliver from Governor Keith. The only ones he found bearing his name were simply sent in his care, and were from a man who had no credit and no influence in London. He found, too, that the governor, for all his great name, had no friends there, 
and that his word was not worth anything as a help or a backing. For Sir William Keith was a broken bankrupt, who had been sent to Pennsylvania as governor simply to get him out of the way. And poor Ben, after a disheartening downfall, realized that this unreliable man had only been fooling him with big promises, just why he could never understand. He had simply found out in a hard and heartless way the truth of the old Bible proverb, put not your trust in princes. He had trusted one who to him was as great as a prince, a governor, and the governor was only great in big words and glittering promises. Poor Ben had been bitterly fooled. But Benjamin Franklin was never one to sit down and fret. He never would despair. Just what to do, he did not know. But he did know he must do something. He could not go back to America until he had earned enough money to take him back. He must try to get a job and get it soon. That was rough, wasn't it? But Ben had good health and plenty of pluck. Pluck seems to be an old-fashioned word for courage or determination. And set out at once to find work. He found it very soon. He was a good workman, you know, and he speedily got a good job in a London printing office where he hoped soon to earn enough to get him back to America again. It's the benefit of having a trade, little buddies. It may be something humble like cleaning houses or whatever, but just to have a trade that you're good at, that you know how to do, and that people want done. That is a job ticket. So please don't do like I did turn 18 without any real knowledge of what you plan on doing and no skills that you can sell for good wages. But London was very fascinating to this young man from far off America. He made good wages, but he spent them almost as fast as earned, or else others spent them for him. For the first time in his life, he grew careless and went wrong. He fell into bad ways, sowed his wild oats, as the saying is, forgot his friends in America, forgot his dear Deborah, and spent months and months in London working steadily at his trade, to be sure, but having what he foolishly called a good time. Then at last he awoke to the knowledge that he was not doing right. He turned over a new leaf at once, worked hard, saved money, and finally engaged with one of the good friends he had made on the voyage across to go back with him to Philadelphia. This friend, whose name was Mr. Denham, liked young Franklin very much and thought he was certain to be a successful man if once he were set right. Mr. Denham had decided to open a general store in Philadelphia. He asked Franklin to be his head clerk and bookkeeper. To this, Franklin gladly consented. So after living in London for nearly two years, Franklin sailed back to America. His own plans had gone all wrong. His dreams of a fine future for himself as the leading printer of Philadelphia had not come true. He had fallen upon hard times, and only his pluck and knowledge of a trade had carried him through. See, there's that job still again, little buddies. Get yourself some job skills. But he learned a lesson he never forgot. It was one that stood him well as a guide and a warning through all his busy life. He had learned when to trust and whom to trust. He knew that, as the farmers say, fine words butter no parsnips. He knew that all is not gold that glitters, and that a man to succeed must help himself, and not rely on others to help him. It takes some men a lifetime to learn all this, but Benjamin Franklin was fortunate enough to learn it early in life. And so on the 21st of July, 1726, he took ship again for America with a good stock of experience with which to start life all over again. And that ends one chapter in a great, great, great book. There are other chapters that are even more interesting and exciting than this one. But this whole book is an inspiration to me, little buddies. I am so glad that I found it. It was written way back in when? Let me look back here at the title page. You know your publication date or copyright date is usually on the back of the title page. 1898 by Lothrop Publishing Company. 1898. Isn't that something? So this book here could be over 120 years old. 
But oh my, it's so much better than what they write for young people these days. Anyway, if you haven't joined the Uncle Rick Audio Book Club yet, this uh, true story of Benjamin Franklin is right there, just waiting for you to enjoy and be inspired by and to learn from. Not to mention all the other great books, not to mention all the wonderful, fun videos that Uncle Rick has there for free once you join. I will now sign off saying, love you little buddies. And always remember, always put God first in your life. Be a patriotic American and honor your father and your mother. So long. Parents, if your kids enjoyed their visit with Uncle Rick, know that they will love the Uncle Rick Audiobook Club. The Uncle Rick Audiobook Club allows access to dozens more stories, both from history and the Bible, to help your kids learn about godly character. Here's what one parent had to say about the book club. My children love the stories. They make history so interesting. My son says it is because of the details that most textbooks don't include. Uncle Rick is easy to listen to. We love his accents and explanations. Thank you so much for that testimony. If you'd like to learn more about the Uncle Rick Book Club, please join us over at UncleRickAudios.com. That is UncleRickAudios.com. See you there.